One of the great pleasures of reading is how it lets you sink into someone else's life, world, or experience and see it all through their eyes. And Lisa Genova's novels do that and more. A neuroscientist, her novel Still Alice, about a woman living with Alzheimer's disease, became an Oscar-winning film. Her latest novel, Every Note Played, takes us into the world of a pianist facing life with ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. And we're delighted to welcome Lisa Genova to our studio tonight. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, Lisa. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. So I finished the book, yeah. and it, this book really shook me. It stayed with me. I was up last night thinking about some of the messages in the book. So this book is not really just about ALS, is it? Right. No, none of them are. Mm -hmm. um, the, I write stories about people living with neurological diseases and disorders who tend to be feared or ignored or misunderstood. And so while the book is about ALS, it can't just be about ALS or I should just write for the Journal of Neuroscience. Mm -hmm. I want this to be accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's really humanizing the disease. It's a human story, it has to wrestle with things that we all care about. And so your discipline is you're a neuroscientist. Yeah. How did you become a novelist? Yeah, it's a pretty weird thing for a neuroscientist <laughs> to become. Um, my grandmother had Alzheimer's, and as the neuroscientist in my family, I tried my best to understand that disease. Mm -hmm. And yet everything I read was scientific or medical or about caregiving, and they were written from the perspective of an outsider, so a clinician, a scientist, a caregiver, a social worker. And I was really left not being able to get from sympathy to empathy. I couldn't stay connected to my grandmother. And it was the thing that was lacking was, what does it feel like to have this? Mm -hmm. And so nothing was told from the perspective of the person with the disease. And so I remember that sort of aha moment, which was, well, fiction story gives us the chance to walk in someone else's shoes. That's a place we can explore empathy. And so that was the, the seed for what became Still Alice, was I want to write a story about a woman living with Alzheimer's and explore that from her perspective. And I mean, wanting to do it because you, your grandmother was living with this disease, how did you get the confidence in yourself to pursue that goal? Yeah, it was like, it was sort of a naive, stupid confidence because I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't realize how difficult it might be to write a book and to get it published. I thought, well, you know, I, I did brain research, so it's, how hard can it be? Um, so, you know, it took about a year and a half to write Still Alice. The, my background in neuroscience was great in terms of doing the research for the story. So I had the credibility to call the chief of neurology at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston um, and ask him, how does someone get diagnosed with Alzheimer's if she's 50? What does that conversation sound like and feel like? And he invited me in to role play that. I shadowed neurologists at Mass General. I interviewed genetic counselors and pr general practice physicians, got to know 27 people mm -hmm. um, living with Alzheimer's. So the, the background really helps me um, get inside and, and learn all of the details of like, the truth of, of what goes on so that I could then write the story. So you, you initially self-published Still Alice, then it was picked up, and yeah. then it became an Oscar-winning movie. Yeah. Um, what led to you writing this book about ALS? Uh, so this is my fifth book, so there has been some space in between. But interestingly, so the... The man who co-wrote the script and co-directed Still Alice, the film, Richard Glatzer, he was diagnosed with ALS two months before he read Still Alice. And then he and his husband, Wash, made the decision to make this film, knowing it would probably be the last thing Richard ever did. And so his ALS, I had always thought ALS began in, in the legs. I thought the paralysis began there. And, and you know, we, we tend to see people with ALS in wheelchairs by the time the media pays attention to someone with this disease. And so I was surprised when I met Richard a few months before we went to set that his ALS began in his neck and head. It's called bulbar ALS. And so I never heard the sound of his voice. Mm. He'd already lost the ability to speak while he could still walk. Um, by the time we got to set, he... Um, he had lost um, mobility in one of his arms, so he was paralyzed in one arm, and he could type with one finger on an iPad, and that's how he directed that film. I want to get, um, I want to speak more about ALS, but you just talking about him, um, even in the book, Every Note Played, it's people who have the disease, it's just, they're more than just the disease. 
Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the themes that come up over and over again in my stories is, you know, if whether it's Alzheimer's or Huntington's, autism, brain injury, ALS, like who are you and how do you matter and, and what matters? So we tend to place our worth and identity in what we do. Mm -hmm. And so for Richard Evans in the story, he's a concert pianist. For most people, 80% of people with ALS their symptoms begin as a weakness in their hands or feet. Mostly it's the dominant hand for some cruel reason. And um, I thought, well, what if this man is a concert pianist and he loses the ability to play? Um, then who is he? And can he, is he still worthy of being loved? Is he still worthy of, of being here as a human being? What makes us human? Uh, there's two types yeah. of ALS, right? Familial and sporadic, I think. Okay, yeah, in yeah. terms of what causes it. Right. So we don't really understand the neurobiology of ALS. We're, we're learning a lot more in recent years. We sort of, 10 years ago, we didn't have the tools to look at this disease. And what few tools we had were really expensive, so only a few scientists in the world could afford to even do the right research. Now we have a lot of tools, and they're cheap to use. So the advancements are coming more rapidly, which is which is exciting. Um, but yes, so 90% of ALS is what we call sporadic. It's caused by a combination of genes that we haven't identified yet, maybe some that we have, um, and environmental influences that we don't yet understand. Mm -hmm. And only 10% are genetic familial. So if mom or dad have ALS, then each kid has a 50-50 chance of getting it. And what's the life expectancy? It's The average is three years after diagnosis. So it can be really fast. I came to know 20 people living with ALS and eight, um, sorry, um, 12 people with ALS and eight of them died before I finished the final draft. And that was around, you know, people came and went in about, you know, a year and a half. And I think a lot of us, uh, when we hear ALS, we think of Stephen Hawking. Yeah. He lived for a very long time. So yeah. uh, why the differences with, other, with the average? It's a great question. Mm -hmm. So Stephen Hawking was diagnosed when he was 21. Told, he was told he'd have a couple years left, which is about the average in some ways. He went a little bit longer, but then he would have died 33 years ago had he not had invasive um, a tracheostomy surgery and invasive ventilation, putting him on 24-7 life support for the rest of his life. He had amazing 24-7 care. He could afford all of those nurses who around the clock made sure he didn't choke on a mucus plug or get pneumonia or bed sores that would lead to infection. Um, but that's extremely expensive. It, it costs a lot of money to go on life support. Uh, only 7% of people, when they get to the point where your, your diaphragm and your abdominal muscles are becoming paralyzed and you can no longer support your own breathing, you can't get in enough oxygen or exhale enough carbon dioxide, you're facing suffocation. So the point that is a fork in the road where you either need to get this surgery that Stephen Hawking had, mm -hmm. or you're you're going to face um, you know hospice or palliative care or someone helping you be you know as comfortable as possible as you die. So most people die, and in the media, you know, we don't pay attention to the, those sort of quiet heroes mm -hmm. who I, who make this very brave choice to let go at home. Um, versus you know Stephen Hawking who was kept alive by life support. The way you write you really connect to what the person is experiencing, what they're feeling. Yeah. How did you do that? Thank you. That was really the gift from the people who had ALS who were willing to share with me what it feels like. So I can read the medical texts and the scientific literature and shadow the neurologists, but then, you know, the real experts are the people who live with this. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not looking to write a scientific piece in the Journal of Neuroscience. I'm writing a story. And if you guys are gonna learn about ALS and get that empathy, I need the story needs to work or you're going to put the book down. Mm -hmm. So I can't be teaching you about ALS. It has to be it has to be story first. And so what does that feel like? The people who had ALS really were willing to be incredibly vulnerable with me and use, you know, some of those precious minutes of the time they had left to let me know what it felt like to live and breathe this disease. And so it was my job to be really permeable and, and vulnerable as well and feel everything they were willing to share with me um, so that I could then get that down on the page. And think, thanks to you and others who have seen the rise of novels about people with neurological conditions, I want to read you a quote from the magazine M Plus One. Okay. Um, and they write, the last dozen years or so have seen the emergence of a new strain within the Anglo-American novel. 
what has been variously referred to as the novel of consciousness or the psychological or confessional novel, the novel at any rate about the workings of a mind has transformed itself into the neurological novel, wherein the mind becomes the brain. As young writers in Balzac walk around Paris pitching historical novels with titles like The Archer of Charles IX, in imitation of Walter Scott, Today, an aspiring novelist might seek his subject matter in a neglected corner or along some new frontier of neurology. Why are we seeing more and more of these novels dubbed neural novels? I love that. <laughs> um, I'd like to think I've, I'm the pioneer of the neuro novel. Um, I think that there's a fascination with the brain. I think in the last decade or so, we've seen a lot of research possible that allows us to understand more of you know, our our moods, our personalities, our desires and addictions, our memory, our language, how we... Maybe know. our worst fears, too. Yeah, I think that people are... So when what happens when those things go wrong? Mm -hmm. So unlike, you know, the heart, which is a pump, and the kidneys a filter, the brain is in charge of all the stuff that we think of that makes us us. Mm -hmm. And so what happens when a piece of that breaks? Um, I think that we're fascinated by that and we're scared of it too. So I think there's a lot of fear and stigma and shame that goes along with mental illness and neurological diseases and disorders. And so fiction becomes a place that is sort of an accessible way to, to step a toe in this sort of scary topic and, and maybe learn a little bit about what we might be a little uncomfortable with in real life. Do you think it's working? I do. Yeah. I really do. I think that, I mean, this is why I do what I do, rather than like go back in the lab and hang out with rats and mice and pipettes. <laughs> I'm writing stories because I think that this is a way of making these scary, somewhat overwhelming neurological diseases and disorders um, accessible, familiar. And then once we have that familiarity and that compassionate awareness, it really helps to bring people who've been excluded from community back in. It helps you see yourself in the other. It helps invite a, a conversation about disease that then actually leads to social change and funding for advancements in medicine. And a big component of this book is Richard's talent. He's mm. incredibly accomplished. Um, and then he can't play the piano, his first love, which he admits to. Do you have a background in music? Because it just felt like you have like a firsthand knowledge of like the classical world. I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> so yeah, with choosing to make Richard a concert pianist and his ex-wife a jazz pianist, while I love the choice, it was like, oh God, no, I have so much more research to do because I, I don't want to fake anything. The story's fiction, but again, I need to be authentic and tell the truth. So no, I don't have a musical background. So that meant a lot of research. Mm -hmm. um, I interviewed many concert pianists. I went to New Orleans to listen to jazz. Um, I took piano lessons wow. to sort of get the feeling of what, and it's so hard, but I love, actually love it, and I'm still playing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I, I did my homework again. We would love if you could read something from the book. Oh, sure. Um, I'll just, uh, uh, I've got on. it marked for you. Okay. You he studies the rubber flesh of his flat right hand limp and lifeless, his curled, distorted left hand no longer possessed by him, both placed on pillows over the arms of his wheelchair in exactly this position by Bill over an hour ago. Richard's entire body is a costume discarded, the party over. He returns to what used to be his elegant left hand and commands the fingers to straighten, knowing they won't. He changes tack, please. His limbs are petulant children, unreachable through begging, bribery, ultimatums, or sweet talk. <sighs> Beautiful passage. Thank you. There's a term that you use in the novel called locked in mm. to describe what's happening with Richard. What does locked in mean? So locked in is the point where you're, so you become increasingly paralyzed. The disease is progressive. It doesn't stop. So eventually for folks, if they do go on life support, um, most folks can, can still blink. And so they'll, they'll blink once for yes and no blink for no. What happens when you can no longer access the muscles that are in charge of blinking? You have no way of reaching the outside world. So I can't use eye gaze technology to type. So a lot of the folks I know who are paralyzed use something called a Toby and they, the, 
uh, camera can detect the pupils and the direction that the eyes are moving, and so you can land on the letters of the keyboard and, and type with your eyes, which is really pretty cool. But what happens when you can't do that anymore? So the brain is working, it's just the body is not cooperating. Right, so for most, for 75% of folks with ALS, their, their intellect, their cognition, their memory is perfectly intact. For 25%, they have frontotemporal lobe dementia as well. So you can be locked in and have dementia, which would, both situations are sort of terrifying. Um, and, I, and I think that this is the, the situation that most people with ALS fear the most. Like, I don't want to be locked in, unable to reach you, unable to communicate. And also unable to take care of yourself, like helping yourself to go to the bathroom. Well, that comes way before. You know. So before you're entirely locked in, you're progressively locked in. So, so for people who lose, you know, Richard loses his arms first, so he can't play piano, but that, that also means he can't feed go himself, mm -hmm. he can't toilet himself. Um, he can flip the light switches on with his mouth. But, you know, it, it's incredibly challenging as you lose more and more of your physicality. You have to depend on others to do that for you. And there's a part in the novel um, where, because Richard and Karina are divorced. Yes. And they've had their problems. That's why they're divorced. Yeah. And then something happens to uh, Richard that threatens to destroy his dignity. Can you tell us what happened? Well, I don't want to give too much, too much away, away yeah. but yeah, I mean, this this disease, you know, it, it isn't it isn't pretty at times, mm -hmm. and and so I didn't want I'm pulling back the curtain, and I don't want I, I'm going to tell the the story with dignity and respect, but also with truth. I'm not going to romanticize it or minimize it. So, um, yeah, it involves you know people need to take care of everything that we normally do ourselves. Somebody else is taking care of your body for you. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so in, in this story, Richard can't be on his own anymore. So his ex-wife actually reluctantly ends up taking him in to, to be his caregiver. And that's a strain on families, right? This taking is, care of their loved ones with ALS? Absolutely. And mm -hmm. so this book is told in both of their points of view. And I thought that was important because ALS never just happens to a person. Mm -hmm. It happens to the person and, and their family. So yeah, the caregiving piece is huge with ALS. And there's a part, I know I don't want to give away too much of the book, but um, there's a part in the book where uh, Richard connects with his family and his brothers. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that they have they know about ALS is the ice water bucket challenge. Yeah. And his brothers think, one of his brothers says, you know, all you have to do is go to the gym and do this. What are some misconceptions that people have about ALS? Yeah, like how are you going to fight it? What are you going to do? Like, do you know, aren't you going to do a documentary or, or start a, a challenge like the ice bucket challenge or go to the gym? I think his brother says something like, well, if this disease is taking your muscles, like get ahead of it, like build some muscle and, and then it, it, you know, you'll be able to stave it off. And it just, the disease doesn't work that way. It isn't a disease of the muscles. It's the disease of the neurons that feed the muscles. So it stops, you stop being able to stimulate. So if I want to use my hand, my brain can say, I want to move the hand, but the nerves can't reach the muscle to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about what goes on with this disease. And that's, again, one of the reasons I was excited to write this story, because I think we tend to think of Stephen Hawking, and that's the only image we have of what ALS looks like. And so we all dumped buckets of ice water over our heads. Millions of people did this across the globe. And so we have a conscious awareness of the letters ALS. But I think most people dumped the bucket of ice water and then they went and like had lunch. Mm -hmm. or And they just move, of course, move on with their lives without any sort of emotional um, understanding of, of what it's like to have this disease. And you also describe what a day-to-day -day life is like for him as the disease becomes worse and worse. What are some of the equipment that he needs to just get through the day? Yeah, the equipment, it's, it's funny, like the people who have this disease, you don't, like me with the novel, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what's next in this disease and it can move really fast. So you get like, okay, the arm is paralyzed, I need X, and then you get used to that. But then the next arm goes and you need a whole another set of, of pieces of equipment. So you need a, probably a power wheelchair, you need, um, you need a shower chair, you need a way of, of transferring yourself from the um, chair to the bed, which can involve something called a Hoyer lift, because you're, you know, if you're dead weight, people can't lift you from A to B. Um, 
there, you need a BiPAP machine to breathe. So while you still can breathe, you might not be able to inhale and exhale fully. So the like BiPAP is like mm -hmm. well, people, mask. Yeah, yeah, the snore. A lot of snorers have something like, similar. Well, for sleep apnea, for, for, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so you might have that. Um, you might have a, a suction machine. It's sort of like in the dentist when they they suck the excess saliva out of your mouth. Someone's doing that because you're having trouble swallowing. And you can actually end up choking on the saliva. Absolutely. Um, you might have a feeding tube because you can no longer swallow well and so you're choking on the food that you're eating so you don't eat anymore and somebody feeds you through um, a tube and that, that's been surgically um, implanted into your stomach. Mm -hmm. um, there are ramps. Um, it sounds expensive. It is expensive. It's incredibly expensive. There are some organizations here and there, like in the US, we have Compassionate Care ALS, which shows up at your door and what do you need? And they have the equipment. So rather than go through the red tape paperwork and insurance and waiting and paying, they try to give you what you need ahead of when you need it. Is there anything that caregivers um, have a hard time uh, understanding when they're taking care of ALS patients? Oh my gosh. There's a, I mean, it's, it's a lot. So I think that, you know, everybody goes through the stages of grief with each new loss. And so, you know, for some, they stay in denial a little longer than, so if a care partner is still in denial that like, well, no, you don't really, this isn't really happening. Um, it can be hard to, to manage what actually is happening. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's hard. I, it's, it's emotionally hard. This is a physical process and it's emotionally hard on, on the folks who have to, to become, you know, how do I, I have to feed you and bathe you and, and toilet you. And because at some point too, uh, someone with ALS, they can't eat solid food, right? They start drinking like a, uh, a drink, like a liquid diet, right? Yeah, before you end up needing um, a feeding tube, before that you, you sort of slowly move your way toward easier and easier foods. You can think back to when your children were learning to eat, you don't just give your you know, toddler a steak dinner, it's you know, the baby food, and then you progress to sort of more and more difficult to chew and swallow foods. Mm -hmm. well, the same is true with someone with ALS, that, that complex coordination of chewing and swallowing, um, it all involves muscles. Mm -hmm. And so if you are, those muscles are weakening, you risk um, choking on the food. I don't want to give away any, anything else uh, in the book, but uh, in Every Note Played, people who work in ALS uh, care sat down to prepare Richard and Karina. What do they tell them to expect as the disease progresses? All of the things that we've been talking about, for sure, that this is, you know, and it's, the, I think that the, the medical community that I was privy to and privileged to be um, in touch with, they're, they're careful not to tell people what they're not ready yet to hear. So someone diagnosed with ALS isn't told, well, this is what death might look like. Um, at some point in ALS, though, that's a conversation people want to have is like, I know I'm getting there. Mm -hmm. So what's that, what's going to happen to me? Like, is it, am I going to be in pain? Am I going to suffer? Am I going to be scared? Like, what is, what is my death going to look like? And I've been in the room with those conversations. But before that, at the beginning, it's just, okay, um, you know, you, you're going to, people with ALS lose a lot of weight. Um, they become hyper metabolic, but they also had just have a hard time physically eating food as the muscles weaken. So it's, you know, cream in your coffee. It's mm. like, like eat, fattening, foods. fattening foods. Um, so it's Liquid just, gold. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's a conversation about where you are now. Like, okay, what can you still do and how can we help you do it safely? And it, the disease uh, with Richard and Karina's relationship, mm. um, I think it also makes, the novel makes a bigger message for all of us. Yeah. Uh, Richard has this disease that's paralyzed his body. But I think you're also saying that we might not have that disease, but in mm. our own lives, mm. maybe we're paralyzed. Right, right. So here's this disease that paralyzes you and you can end up locked in and we're all like, oh my God, that's terrifying and that's mm. awful and it's heartbreaking and it is. And then yet sort of emotionally, how many of us are paralyzed in our own lives, stuck in some way because we're afraid or we have excuses or we have blame. So we're not moving on in terms of a new relationship because we're stuck dwelling on the past one that didn't work out. Or we really want to do this thing in life. We have this dream, but we're, we don't allow ourselves to try it because we have all these excuses and reasons why due to fear probably that we, we can't allow ourselves to do that. So for Karina and Richard, they're both stuck emotionally in some ways, in part because of the broken relationship that they lived through in the, in the 
divorce and in the marriage. Um, and, and in part, just, you know, in Karina's life's dream, she has reasons why she can't do it. And so she's very much stuck in a life that's very unfulfilling. And through, their, through the course of this journey, they both have a chance to sort of recognize the ways that they're stuck. And communication too, mm -hmm. right? So again, with ALS, we're gonna lose the ability to speak and that's horrifying. And, and yet how many of us who, I can say anything I want to right now, I don't have ALS, but how many of us say, I'm sorry, or I forgive you, or I love you enough to the people that we need to say these things to. Mm -hmm. and so here we have two people where there's so much unspoken, so much tension, so much unresolved, and will they be able to maybe speak and say what needs to be said while they still can? Because time is running out. Yeah, and so and that's really hyper focused and urgent when you have something like ALS. Mm -hmm. But time is running out for all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have forever to do these things. And so I think that and I'm hoping that in the book that some of those, you know, while we're going to learn about ALS for sure, I think it's also an opportunity, hopefully, for sort of these human human um, struggles that we all have to ha give everybody a chance to think about the ways in their own lives in which they might be able to unlock and, and, and heal. So that's the other thing, like we can't cure ALS, but in what ways can these characters find healing? Lisa, thank you so much for being here. And this is such an incredible book. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks so much. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.